Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. I think it's very clear that this is a, a network. Who helped the Manchester bomber? The arrests, the clues, and the widening search. The signs of resilience, a city pulled apart by grief, comes together in a show of solidarity and support. And by the end of this week, the Conservatives will have a new leader who will want to be the next Prime Minister. The insiders take us behind the scenes for what to expect. Plus... I will never forget your warmth, love, support and tolerance, especially when I hit some of you with my stick. Blind but unbroken the Bangladeshi woman viciously attacked by her husband gets her law degree from UBC. For investigators, the net is widening. For suspects in Manchester and beyond, the walls are closing in. In unraveling the who and the how of Monday's horrific attack in Manchester, authorities are working fast. Today alone, at least six people were arrested in the UK, five in the Manchester area, another in a town about 160 kilometres to the south, and about 3,000 kilometres to the south in Tripoli, local authorities made more arrests. The concern, if this is no lone wolf, other attacks are possible. Nala Ayed has more. In the back-to-back -back raids and the multiple arrests, Police are closing in on a theory that Monday night's suicide bombing was actually an international group effort. I think it's very clear that this is a, a network that we are investigating. And as I've said, it continues at a pace. Uh, there's extensive investigations going on uh, and activity taking place across Greater Manchester as we speak. So. The starting point was British citizen Salman Abedi, who'd just been in Libya where his parents live. Back in Manchester, he was captured on CCTV video obtained by Sky News, just days away from detonating a backpack bomb. Photos of what remained of it, leaked to the New York Times, suggest a ruthless sophistication. The metal screws packed for brutal efficiency. Impossible, his father Ramadan said in Libya. Salman belonged to no organization. He might have been framed, he says. A short while later, Abide's father was arrested. And so were two of Abide's brothers. One of them, Hashim, also in Libya, may have been preparing an attack of his own. Even as police hunted for clues through the house where Abide lived, hints emerged of missed opportunities that the authorities knew of things Abide said that suggested he would one day kill. Neighbours worry about what comes next. I don't know, it just frightens me completely, really scares me, as what's going to happen now, what retaliation there'll be. At the mosque where Abide prayed, reports are coming in of harassment, and there's impatience with the assumptions based on the vile actions of one man. Well, obviously, ex extremist peoples are everywhere, okay? Some people who, who want to take some extra mileage out of this to create hatred among people, uh, they are always there. I hope it doesn't uh, exist in Manchester. Abede's actions have no support here, the leader said. This act of cowardice has no place in our religion or any other religion, for that matter. But it is a homegrown problem that Britain and Manchester will have to contend with. I personally believe it is started in Manchester. The majority of the members are in Manchester. But over time and over the travelling that uh, Suleiman has been doing might have now extended itself to reach Libya and Syria as well. The country's also suffered the highest single-day loss of life in more than a decade. It is a lot to take in. But even as the unsettling revelations pile up, the message from Manchester is still defiance. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Manchester. 
Well, for more on where this investigation could lead, Adrian Arsenault joins us. Yesterday you talked about how some of the information about the bombing was coming from U.S. authorities. That's caused problems. The British seem furious on that. Oh, they're incandescent. The British Prime Minister says that she intends to bring it up with Donald Trump tomorrow at the NATO summit in Brussels. I mean, I don't know exactly what he can do about it, but the Brits keep saying that they're losing an operational edge when all this forensic information gets leaked out. But it's still happening. You know, a Texas Republican congressman today said that that Manchester bomb had traces of TATP in it. Now, if this is true, that's the same explosive that was used in Paris. There was about a kilo of it in the suicide belts. It's the same explosive that was used in Brussels, much bigger quantity, some 20 kilos of it. This is something that ISIS really likes to use. They even published a manual in 2014 with a recipe for TATP. It's, it's not something that Al-Qaeda has used much, if at all. They tried. In 2001 with a shoe bomber, it didn't work. It's apparently really hard to make it stable. So again, if it's TATP, then could Abedi really have done this on his own just a few days after coming back from Libya? I mean, maybe it's possible, but more likely there's a bomb maker, which means there's a bomb factory, which means there's another question. Would they go to all that trouble for just one? That's really what the urgency is behind all these searches right now. Let's uh, talk about connections here for a moment because uh, one assumes there are certain threads that investigators are pulling on. What are you hearing? Uh, the key one is who did he know? I mean, it's already clear that Abedi would lived very close to and had some contact with two well-known recruiters in Moss Side in Manchester. One is a man named Raphael Hosti. He died in a drone strike last year. But this young man from the neighborhood was responsible for smuggling, you know, dozens of men to go fight with terror groups. There's another young British-born man of Libyan descent also in the neighborhood. Also, he's in jail right now also for trying to smuggle people to fight with terror groups. So did these connections form a network? And what is the link with Libya? We spend so much time talking about Syria and Iraq. We don't talk about Libya enough, but that's where the terror groups have been operating freely. So you have to know that this investigation is spreading very far, very fast. All right. Adrian, thanks very much. Okay. Well, fears of another attack are so high that British soldiers were deployed to high-profile sites across the country today, most of them in the capital. Susan Ormiston has more on what the threat level critical looks like in London. The threat level system was established here in Britain a year after the subway bombings in London in 2005. This is only the third time it's been raised to the highest level that's critical and only the first time in a decade. What does it mean? Well, the government now has the power to put the army on the streets and it says it will send almost a thousand soldiers out to secure places like Westminster, the British Parliament. In fact, tours and visits here have been completely cancelled indefinitely. Over at Buckingham Palace, the changing of the guard has been cancelled, no doubt disappointing some tourists. Well, we were concerned. Um, I cannot say that we're really stressed about we noticed a lot of policemen, police officer, uh, helicopter today around. Um, no, I don't think we're nervous, but we're concerned. We're for sure sad with, with what happened. I mean, it's, it's terrible. The plan is called Operation Temperer. That critical level has a pretty precise definition. According to security officials, it's that an attack is expected imminently. Now, the Prime Minister of Britain, Theresa May, only would say last night, that there may be an imminent attack. One more thing is there's a general election going on here in two weeks, and some people have asked whether politics influenced the decision to raise the threat level, or whether security agencies just cannot risk the prospect that a bomber is making another bomb and plotting another attack. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. British police say all 22 people killed at Monday's concert venue have now been identified and their families notified. But not all of their names have been made public yet. We've already told you about the youngest victim of the attack, as well as a teenage superfan of the show's star, and another girl whose mother went on TV early yesterday pleading for information. Two other teenage girls died and two older male fans. Another concert goer killed was Kelly Brewster, 
who reportedly shielded her 11-year-old niece from the blast. But several other adults who died were only at the venue to pick up kids. They included a married couple from Poland and two moms, friends who were waiting together for their teenage daughters. Another was Michelle Kiss, who'd been at the show with her 12-year-old daughter. Poignant photos of her little girl being comforted by police illustrated the pain and tragedy of the moment like no others. A homeless man in Manchester is being hailed as a hero for running into the concert venue after the explosion to help the victims. And it was children, you know what I mean? And there was a lot of children with blood all over them and everything, so and crying and screaming. It, 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 well, if, if I didn't help, I wouldn't be able to live with myself for, for walking away and sitting and leaving kids like that. Well, after hearing Steve Jones' story, the owners of the West Ham United Football Club took to Twitter with an offer of a free home for six months, if anyone could put them in touch. By day's end, social media came through and a man's life had been changed. Kindness rewarded with kindness. Coming up, Jamie, Kathleen and David are here in a few moments to give you the insider's take on how this weekend may unfold as the Conservatives meet to pick their new leader. And later. So this is like one of my favorite fabrics right here. Black for Brides, the South Asian designer who's found success breaking cultural taboos. The Italian Coast Guard and several other vessels raced to a deadly scene on the Mediterranean this morning where 1,700 migrants packed onto 15 boats were trying to get from Libya to Italy. Dozens of them were babies. Stephen D'Souza picks up the story from New York. On Europe's doorstep, yet another tragedy unfolds. It happened all within sight of rescue ships. A migrant ship teeming with people desperate to escape famine and war suddenly listed. Among the dozens in orange life jackets in the water, more than 200 without any help to stay afloat. Ships raced frantically to reach as many as they could, but more than 30 migrants drowned. Those on site say many were toddlers. With no morgue on board, bodies were placed on the deck. It happened today in the Mediterranean, off the coast of Libya, along the main route chosen by those fleeing Africa and the Middle East. Migrant crossings first made international headlines in 2015, punctuated by the death of Syrian Alan Kurdi. Those images of the three-year-old, whose lifeless body washed ashore in Turkey, seemed to galvanize the world to act. The world may have since turned to other issues, but the crossings haven't stopped. Arrivals in Italy are up 46% from last year. The Coast Guard there is doing what it can to keep up, as even more chance the perilous journey, fraught by smugglers, unsafe boats, and rough waters. For many, they feel the danger they're leaving behind is worth the risk. So far this year, close to 60,000 migrants have crossed to Europe by sea, more than 50,000 to Italy alone. Today's drownings bring the number of dead and missing to more than 1,500. Italy is on the front lines, and the country is hoping to bring the migrant issue to the table when G7 leaders meet in Sicily beginning Friday. But while the island's location provides the perfect backdrop for the issue, world leaders won't see it up close. Migrant ships won't be allowed to dock in Sicilian ports during the summit for security reasons. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. The final results are in from British Columbia's provincial election at long last. The thought was some results could flip, but after the recounts, it's status quo. The Liberals won the most seats, 43, still one shy of a majority government. Liberal leader Christy Clark says her party has a responsibility to go ahead and form a government. Major construction sites across Quebec are quiet today after 175,000 workers across the province went on strike overnight. <laughs> workers picketed at major job sites in Montreal, including the Champlain Bridge and the city's new hospital. Sticking points in negotiations are over pay and wanting a more fixed work schedule. Strong winds knocked over trees and down power lines in British Columbia overnight. At the height of the storm, 85,000 homes and businesses were in the dark. 
Daylight revealed these shipwrecks. The winds calmed down through the day. But those winds later caused damage and headaches in Alberta. Dangerous gusts even made it unsafe for planes to take off or land in Edmonton for a short while, forcing some planes to divert. Six years ago, Rumana Mansour was viciously attacked by her husband, leaving her permanently blind. But undeterred, she opted to continue her studies at the University of British Columbia. Today, her dedication paid off. Briar Stewart picks up the story. Even in a room full of stories of perseverance and dedication, there are none that quite compared to Romana Monsoor's journey to get here. Today, a law school graduate, Romana Monsoor, and a survivor. In 2011, she was brutally attacked by her husband during a visit home to Bangladesh. He gouged her eyes and bit off the end of her nose. The reason? She wanted a divorce and he didn't want her to pursue an academic career. I became blind. I never saw the world again. But she did return to Vancouver where students and faculty at UBC raised tens of thousands of dollars to help her continue her studies. They have given me the hope to live again. She had to adapt to her new reality, relying on others to help her find her way around and using specialty software programs to complete her schoolwork. Not only did she finish her master's, but she went on to law school. My comfort zone has always been school. I'm learning something, but at the same time, I'm trying to cope up with my new life. One of the biggest challenges, raising her daughter, Anusha. She was in the audience today to watch her mom graduate and deliver the speech. I feel good for her, like, you know, she's been able to achieve all these things. Mansoor credits her classmates and professors with helping her get through school. And they are in awe of her resolve. She's forged her own path forward and I don't, I can't think of another person who could have done it in the same way. I will never forget your warmth and tolerance especially when I hit some of you with my stick. <laughs> Come the fall, she'll be articling with the law firm in the city. Mansoor says now that graduation day is finally here, she can start setting some new goals. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. There's another special graduation moment we want to show you, this one in California. Marty O'Connor was receiving his MBA. Especially impressive given that five years ago he was paralyzed below the neck after falling down a flight of stairs. A former volleyball player and surfer, the accident in 2012 was life altering. At first, I honestly was just in denial because I was an athlete. I've been, you know, in sports my entire life. Marty endured intense physical therapy, but decided he needed a new mental challenge a master's degree. I was in Florida teaching at the time when Marty's accident happened and it was killing me. I couldn't have my own child needing me doing a job at the same time. So Judy joined her son, acting as his note taker, helping with every test, every study session. Martin Michael O'Connor. <laughs> and this weekend when Marty crossed the stage, Judy was there too but keep watching. We now have a special individual who the faculty, the administration, and the board of trustees have decided to honor with an honorary MBA degree. <laughs> Mrs. Judith O'Connor has attended all the classes with her son, Marty. She has taken notes and worked with, <laughs> worked with Marty throughout his academic career. Oh, shoot. <laughs> it was a surprise planned and orchestrated by her son. I had worked and talked to so many people to make it happen, and I was just so excited for her because she deserved it so much. I was totally blown away. I was just helping my son. The two will continue to work together at the foundation started in Marty's name. Straight ahead, the president meets one of his strongest critics, Pope Francis. 
And later, as the Conservative Party prepares to choose its new leader, the insiders set the stage for this weekend. The National with Peter Mansbridge. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Well, we are a long way from our usual cozy studio tonight. It's about 3,000 kilometers that way. This is the Northwest Passage. We're in a shaft of the old syndicate coal mines here in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. These are unusual surroundings for the National. We're about an hour north of Fort McMurray from Stratford, Ontario in Delta, British Columbia. From Parliament Hill in Saskatoon. Going live off the deck of an icebreaker in Vancouver. From Montreal, once again tonight, a city at the heart of a crisis in the cold. Do you worry about the ice? Yes, I do, yeah. Um, what's gonna happen if it all melts, melts away? All jolly we miner men, and miner men are we. They've all worked the coal mines in Cape Breton. Now they sing to preserve the heritage and the folklore of the island's mining communities. <laughs> Canada is still here tonight, but just barely. Quebecers have voted no to sovereignty. But of course, the story the whole world is watching is the historic switch to the year 2000. This is the day that Winnipeg has been waiting for, worrying about, even dreading. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge from downtown Toronto. For the most part, an eerily dark Toronto. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge inside Vatican City. Good evening from the Netherlands, Baghdad. In Tiananmen Square tonight from London. In Vimy Ridge, France. From Kandahar, Afghanistan. Here in Berlin, there's another opening in the wall tonight, number 22. When the waves crashed ashore here and they didn't have far to come, there's the beach line. Our ride today is on an Israeli Air Force Black Hawk helicopter. That is the area that the suicide bombers used to get to some of their targets. Look at this. Those are the papal apartments just over on the other side. That's where the Pope lives. As night falls, we're back on the road, moving through the streets of Kandahar, and as always, on the lookout. Thanks for watching. Prime Minister is in Brussels tonight ahead of tomorrow's NATO summit. It's the first meeting of the NATO alliance since Donald Trump was elected. The leaders are expected to talk climate change, military commitments and even trade. Efforts to fight terrorism will also likely be added to the agenda. Trudeau will go from Brussels to Italy where he will meet with the Pope. Trump was at the Vatican today for a meeting that had all the potential for some awkward moments. During the election campaign, the Pope was critical of Trump's plan to build a wall, remarks that Trump called disgraceful. So, how did it all go? Ellen Morrow has the story. Only Donald Trump cracked a smile in the family photo with the Pope. But that's not to say there weren't light moments during his Vatican visit. The biggest coming when Pope Francis asked Melania Trump what she feeds her husband, an apparent playful dig at the president's weight. Along with jokes, there were politics. The Pope gifting Trump his papal writing on climate change, once dubbed a hoax by the president. Trump gave the Pope a set of writings by Martin Luther King Jr. Trump described the meeting as fantastic. It seems both men were able to forget their past war of words. Last year, the Pope suggested Trump's plan to build a border wall with Mexico wasn't Christian. Trump fired back, calling the Pope's comments disgraceful. Brussels seems less forgiving. Protests greeted Trump's arrival there this afternoon. He's just a clown that has been elected and he's going to take away all the rights that we have been fighting for for over a century. And the European leg could prove to be the most difficult of Trump's tour. He'll be meeting his NATO counterparts, an alliance he's repeatedly disparaged in the past. 
The U.S. Secretary of State says Trump will pressure NATO allies to up their defense spending. The American people are doing a lot uh, for your security, for our joint security. You need to make sure you're doing your share for your own security as well. After NATO, it's the G7, two major international summits for the rookie president. Lots of pressure, but also opportunity. A chance to calm major allies still unsure of what to make of the Trump presidency. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Southern Philippines is under martial law and it could be expanded to the whole country. Overnight, Muslim extremists kidnapped a Catholic priest and more than a dozen worshipers and church workers. Many people fled their homes. The violence broke out after the Philippine army tried to capture an Abu Sayyaf commander Tuesday in Marawi. The militant group called in reinforcements and managed to seize large parts of the city. The deadly start to this year's climbing season on Mount Everest continued today. Sherpas found the bodies of four climbers at the mountain's highest camp. Ten people have died trying to reach the summit already this year, four more than in a typical year. Straight ahead, this weekend is an important one for the Conservative Party. As it chooses its successor to Stephen Harper, the insiders give us the lay of the land. And later, the South Asian designer who's stitched together cultures for a line of bridal gowns. But first, time for today's business numbers. The TSX fell 57 points. The Canadian dollar gained a sixth of a cent. In New York, the Dow rose 74 points. The price of oil was down 11 cents a barrel. Hello there, if you're watching on uh, Facebook, this is our little Facebook Live cover for the next four minutes on the uh, commercial that's going on out there in TV land. But we're uh, going to you on Facebook Live right now and uh, lucky enough to have some of your questions and let's have a look at what's come in so far. Uh, Penny Torrens and asks, Peter, will you be doing the 150 celebrations on Parliament Hill this year? Yes, I will. Where are we? Here? Uh, yes, I will. Um, on July 1st. In fact, that'll be my last day on the job. It should be um, a great day on Parliament Hill. Ioannis uh, Arvius Diaz, I'm sorry if I've got that name wrong, asks, as a CBC broadcaster for a long time, do you think Canada should start to seriously amp up its intelligence gathering and enforcement to prevent these kind of terrorist attacks here at home? Actually, it, you know, it seems to me we've, we've done pretty well here. You never hear about the attacks that have been prevented. They don't usually make a big announcement on, on that. Sometimes if they result in arrests, obviously we hear about them. Um, but I'm sure they're always considering new ways of trying to ensure your safety. Eric Lamb asks, Peter, did you get to choose your hairstyle when you were younger? I did. You know, I, I spent a lot of time, I said, if there's any chance I could be bald by the time I'm 30 and then progressively balder all the time after that, I'd be really happy and that's the style I would like. Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't get to choose my hairstyle. In fact, none of us get to choose that. Uh, Sydney Apted asks, you say climate change is one of the most pressing issues of the age. I do, you're right about that, Sydney. I do think it is. What's the CBC doing to cover this issue? We do a lot to cover this issue in a variety of different ways when various reports come out, a couple of big ones in the last couple of weeks about Antarctica, and we've spent time on that in terms of the uh, polar cap in that uh, area, and especially the huge um, areas of ice sheet that are uh, slipping into the ocean, but also in terms of um, uh, ways to adapt to the oncoming rush of climate change, and there is, as a re the results, adaptation, we've We've done lots of coverage on that. Too much for those who deny this is even happening. I can tell you that. James Luke Peter asks, has any government attempted to censor your broadcast? No. 30 years I've been hosting the National. We've never had any government try to censor us. Have we had governments and political parties of the opposition try to influence what we say? Sure, that's, that's part of the process that you see happening. Uh, in any democratic country, but censor broadcast? Never. Uh, Lisa McPherson, oh, wait a minute, skipped one. 
And Maria Grazia asks, what's your favorite part of the job? It's a great job, it changes every day. You're always dealing with different issues, talking to different people, interviewing different people. Um, so you're, you're learning a lot about the world in which we live and that's, that's a great thing. Uh, what'd you say, Al, one minute? One minute, yeah. uh, Lisa McPherson asks, was there one pivotal moment in your life when you knew you wanted to be a journalist? Um, uh, lots of pivotal moments during my journalistic career where I was glad to be a journalist and look forward to more journalism. Probably, I probably point to when I, was, when I was a kid growing up in a family that cared about what was going on around them. We used to sit at the dinner table. We were lucky enough to have uh, my sister and I to have our, our parents home every night when we were very young. And we, uh, you know, we talked about current affairs. We talked about issues that affected our community and our country and our world. And in, in many ways, that's kind of the basis of journalism, asking questions, challenging assumptions, and telling what you know to other people. We gotta get back to The Insiders, coming up in two seconds. So 13 candidates, a process almost guaranteed to mean at least half a dozen ballots, and likely very little convention floor drama. What should we make of all that? The Conservative Leadership Convention this weekend. The Insiders are here to help. Jamie Watt is a Conservative strategist. Kathleen Monk is with the NDP, she's in Ottawa tonight, and David Hurley of the Liberals is here with Jamie in Toronto. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, here are some basics. The convention is in Toronto, but almost all the voting will take place across the country. There are more than a quarter of a million eligible to vote, probably around half will. Fourteen names are on the ballot, but one, Kevin O'Leary, has dropped out. Friday night is for speeches. Saturday, the winner is declared. Delegates have been voting for a couple of weeks already, listing their first, second, and so on choices. Voting stops Saturday at 4 p.m. Toronto time, and then the party will drag out announcing the results starting at 5 p.m. Will this be exciting? Could we be surprised? Let's find out. Well, I said just the basics, and those are just the basics. There's one other element, the 338 ridings, 100 points per riding. You get the number of points your vote in each riding uh, breaks down to on percentage terms, and you add them all up, and whoever has more than half the total number of points, which are in the hundreds of thousands, uh, ends up winning. Having said all that, it's a different process, and, you know, they're experimenting, I, I, I guess, on, on some level. Is this... You know, is it a good process or a bad process, Gene? I think it's a crazy process, Peter. I mean, p political parties, especially in opposition, have very few chances to connect in a meaningful way with Canadians. They've designed this process to tune everybody out and have them getting on with their summer. You know, it, it, people say it's more efficient. Well, the last time the Conservative Party did this was 13 years ago. I don't think they need to worry about efficiency. The second thing they've, they've tossed away is the ability of any of the candidates to connect with voters. When we did the Jim Flaherty's first leadership campaign, which he lost, his speech raised his, his uh, vote total 17 points. In the, in the last NDP convention, when we saw Nathan Cullen speak, you know, he didn't get the benefit of that terrific speech. So I think this is for the birds. And he's the conservative on the panel. <laughs> uh, Kathleen, what do you make of it? I have to agree with Jamie. I think it really, the, the way they've set up the convention and the voting process, it really denies members the chance to kind of, once they perhaps lose their first choice, the ability to rally behind um, a second candidate and to have that drama on the floor and to see how the collective mind of the convention works and moves towards the second candidate. So I think it, it basically sets up a situation where they're going to have hashtag fake drama at the convention, right? Because they'll actually know the results. Basically, they could have them uh, you know, re released Saturday morning, but they're holding on to them to kind of create this fake sense of drama that doesn't really exist. Hashtag fake drama. She's, <laughs> she's ready for the weekend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a hashtag fail, as I recall. Yeah, but, uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I agree with them completely, but I'll, since, and, and for the reasons that they've articulated, but so since that's been well uh, covered territory, I'll say a positive side of it is that second and subsequent ballots at conventions are very chaotic things and people have to make up their minds in a big hurry about what they're going to do when their candidate drops off the ballot and so well, you could argue that, that chance here could argue that this uh, 
allows them to think of who their second and third choices are in a more deliberative, reflective way. Ahead of time. Ahead of time. Uh, rather than in that melee where you're caught up in emotion. And but we love that melee. I know. That's mm -hmm. what makes them dramatic. I know. For all of us who are in politics, that's the whole thing. Yeah. He's being pretty generous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he, he was searching mm -hmm. for a positive. And there, there it is. Uh, in the end, the winner will be declared with whoever's got more than 50% uh, of the accumulated vote. So at the moment, the lead is said to be uh, Maxime Bernier. Um, so when you look at that first ballot result, nobody expects him to have it on the first ballot. What does he have to have to be taken seriously in, in, in the ballots that follow? Jamie? Mm -hmm. uh, one of these, uh, the rules of these things, of course, is if they were people were voting in a convention would be momentum, right? So he would have to achieve a number bigger than what people expected. So this would be, you know, he'd have to be sizably ahead. Uh, given that that's not the case, and we're just going to be reading the tea leaves of what votes that have already been cast, and it reminds me a bit of a bicycle race. You know, where's the pack? Where's the peloton? Who makes up each part of those things? And I think, for example, if he doesn't do better than people expect, I think he's going to have a tough day. I'd watch for um, Lisa Raitt to do better than people expect. I'd watch uh, for Aaron O'Toole. I think his message is in the latter part of the campaign has got some traction, and I think he might surprise as well. If those two things happen, even though the votes are already, already ca cast, a bit like a canary in a coal mine predicting what's going to come next. Does anybody mm -hmm. want to give me a number of what he needs? I mean, I like I will. that strategy. Uh, oh, Kathleen? I mean, I, I think there's a couple things. I think you're right that we, we assume that Bernier is the front runner because of the fact that O'Leary backed him. But we really don't know because no one's polling in the way that how this vote is being tabulated with 100 points per riding. So mm -hmm. we really have no idea. That said, I think we have to see Bernier uh, with more than 25 percent, closer to maybe 30 on the first, first ballot to really think that he's going to have a clear path. Conversely, People like O'Toole and Shear, the the closest uh, to the front runners, really need to be above 15 percent. So, you know, we'll know uh, then if if they will have a chance of kind of usurping Bernier's supposed lead. David, yeah, I don't I don't know that I can come up with a number because, as Kathleen said, nobody really knows what's going on inside this thing, and I haven't run into many conservatives that even claim to know what's going on inside this thing. I know, for instance, that if a front runner showed up at a convention with 25 percent on the first ballot, they're probably finished, right? Mm -hmm. Because the convention turns on them, yes. they have underachieved, and everything galvanizes against them. They don't have to face that here, so he could get 25 percent and still win. I'm probably going to be trying to read the entrails of underlying data, like. Did he do as well in Quebec as people expected him to do right. on the first ballot, right? What is the gap between him and Scheer or O'Toole, whoever is second based on prognostications? Um, and try to figure out things from that. Is he underperforming or overperforming in ways we can actually measure based on our anticipation? But I don't think the normal rules apply about a front runner because I think normally he wouldn't even really be considered a front runner in this race. You know, a, a wise old man of conservative politics, uh, both current and past uh, progressive conservative politics, sent me a message this week saying, beware the Joe Clark syndrome coming out of absolutely nowhere. Uh, the, you could win this and remember the big newspaper headline the next day, uh, Joe who. Um, is that a possibility this week? Yeah, well, Peter, I think if you look at who makes up the field, uh, none of them are very well known. Mr. Well, Bernier. A lot of Joe There's a lot of Joe Hoos. They're all Joe's. Yeah. Mr. Bernier is not known out of Quebec. Uh, Ms. Leach is known for all the, wrong, uh, all the wrong reasons. The rest of them you couldn't pick out of a police lineup. So whoever wins is going to be shaking a lot of hands. A lot of talk about the Joe Who issue, but there's also the Flora syndrome. Right. Well, we remember mm -hmm. Flora McDonald went in we, in great shape, but everybody went lots into that. Lots of buttons, no votes. Lots of buttons, but no votes. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's also possible to have. I think Bernier's real trick is he's got to do really well in Quebec and a couple other places that it's his. If not, I think anything's open to see what happens. Kathleen, um, when you look at this race unfolding by the uh, not your party, but another party that you will have to run against in some form in the next mm -hmm. election. Is this a race about individuals, about people, or is it a, a race about ideology? Do you, see, do you see that shaping up here? 
Yeah, amongst the front runners, I don't really see uh, a real ideological uh, race being put forward. Um, if there was one, you could kind of almost call it Harper Light or Harper with a smile or Harper with a sweater vest redu, you know, and that would be the kind of Bernier Sheer O'Toole. Um, uh, you know, while O'Toole, Sheer is more of, um, Andrew Sheer is more of the SOCON in terms of the top runners uh, he, on abortion, gay marriage, etc. He has really embraced a lot of Harper's policies and, and will manage caucus likely in that way. Um, O'Toole, while strong on public safety issues, um, isn't really seen as a SOCON. Uh, Bernier is the interesting character because he really is a libertarian. He, he really disagrees with basically 50 percent of what a federal government normally does. So it'll be interesting to see, because he doesn't have the caucus support that O'Toole does or, or Scheer does, how he manages the caucus and actually presents a platform in the coming campaign if he wins. Any disagreement on that? No, I don't think it has anything to do with ideology. None of the standard bearers of the Reform Party or the PC's wing uh, contested this race. The leading contender is neither one of those mm -hmm. uh, factions. And I've never seen a leadership race that was decided over ideology anyway. Major parties select their leaders on the basis of who they think is most likely to win, win. the general that's election. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. the litmus test is Trudeau. Who can beat Trudeau? That's right. That's, that's, yeah. that's the question. I mean... You know, Delegates of mine, we've all of mine. been at and watched and covered leadership conventions of all parties in the past. And, and so often what happens in the days after, the parties split. It's divided. There are factions mm -hmm. and they fight against each other and they never seem to get together. What are the odds of, uh, of this party leaving this convention in Toronto this weekend, whatever they decide, of leaving it united? David? Pretty good. Pretty good, actually. Uh, this not, doesn't appear to me to have uh, been a very divisive uh, race, with the possible exception of Ms. Leach's uh, interventions um, in the race. Uh, I don't sense that there's a big anti-Bernier, anybody but Bernier movement out there. So if he were to if he were to win, I, I don't know that the party's going to be repulsed by that. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I just don't see some of the major schisms uh, Cretchen, Martin, uh, Turner, Cretchen, a Mulroney, Clark, epic sort of division in the party that you that creates those kinds of divisions. Jamie, I think you know Peter. One of the things that's been debated in this leadership contest is, do we want to continue with Stephen Harper's approach or do we want something new? Do we want something in the, in the middle? One thing I think all everybody agrees on that Stephen Harper got right is conservatives win when they're united, and when mm. they lose. Well, they lose when they're not united, and the Liberals will win 10 times in 10 if there's a schism in the party. So I think that will trump any temp, pardon the expression, uh, any, uh, I try to get that, that, out, to get that really out of my vocabulary, I know it's like swearing. Um, yeah. I think that will be more important than any short-term divisions that, that exist. You have the last word, Kathleen. Yeah, I just add that the, whoever wins on Saturday is inheriting a party that's in really good shape. They have a strong, large caucus of 100, approximately 100 uh, MPs. They have the best fundraising numbers in the last quarter. They have over 250,000 uh, memberships, the highest rate out of all of the parties currently. So it's a pretty uh, great title if you get to have it. And so I think the party, as David and, and Jamie have both said, will be united going forward. Forward. Although there are still, you know, headwinds and some challenges that if a Bernier does win, how he keeps the rural caucus on side because of his, his how he approaches the supply management issue. Well, they'll leave, they'll leave United. Whether they yeah. stay United is a different matter. And Good I think point. one of the, yes, one of the interesting right. things yeah. about Mr. Bernier is not just that he's ideological, but he appears to be rigidly ideological. So I don't know um, whether he's really well suited to leading a big tent party. Right. And, and don't forget, uh, Peter, that uh, they're following Ron Ambrose, who's done a terrific job right. of keeping that place together uh, mm -hmm. during this whole process. And a lot of people wish he was on the ballot. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Good to talk. We'll, uh, we'll assess it all next week. CBC News will have all the action from the Conservative Leadership Convention. Rosemary Barton will join us along with that issue and our main analysts, Peter McKay, Michelle Rempel and Kevin O'Leary. They'll all be part of our live coverage this Friday and Saturday on CBC News Network, CBC Television and online. We've got to take a short break, but just ahead, the designer who's pushing the boundaries of South Asian bridal wear. Another edition of Exhibitionists is coming right up. This is the story of building the Trans Mountain Pipeline.
Between Jasper and Red Pass, a start is made. All the latest weapons employed by engineers in modern pipeline construction converge on the theaters of war. The enemy, one by one, toppling to echoing cries of timber. And the steel monsters arrive. To 140 sidings from Edmonton to Vancouver, 5,000 railway flat cars bring their loads of pipes and then to their individual prearranged spots in the continuous chain. They're linked together by a complicated process that assures 100% accuracy. The pipe is 24 inches in diameter, and every inch of it must be evenly coated. And then, check and recheck. Then a wrapping is added, made from glass, felt, and asbestos as the men observe their finished product laid to rest. A continuous tube, liquid railway, stretching 718 miles. The big question is, of course, whether there is life on Mars, and the short answer is that it's not impossible. No one knows what Mars really looks like, but this week, streaming back from deep space is the best information in history bringing us nearer the answers concerning the origin of life, whether man is something special or a special freak. The search for life on Mars is still continuing. Data received from the Viking landers have puzzled NASA scientists, and within the past two days, they've been able to confirm that the ice caps of Mars are really frozen water, not carbon dioxide as once believed. So the chances of finding life get better with each passing day. Its past was hostile and torn by meteors. Its present is cold and barren. A colony here would seem a futile fantasy. But today's dreamers are scientists, and they do their dreaming for NASA. I think the possibility of Mars as a second home for mankind is very important for our future as a race. The students are building a prototype Martian colony called Marsville. It's on Earth, but they do understand what it will take to settle on Mars. The temperature on Mars is a lot colder than on Earth. And these students understand cooperation is the only way to get to Mars. I mean, with all the technology they have now, we could have somebody go up pretty soon. They've come from all over the world for this meeting of the International Mars Society. They've got bumper stickers. They've got a Martian flag already picked out. The one question that always comes up is this. Is it worth the many billions more to put people on the surface of the red planet rather than just machines? The Mars fans here admit the barriers are huge, but they also say we have the capability and the money to get to Mars. All we need now is the will to do it. To find out more, we need to go out into space, and space research, like politics, is the art of the possible. What we would like to do must be weighed against what we can do. This week's Exhibitionist is about pushing boundaries. Canadian designer Manny Jassel knew when she started designing Indian bridal fashion that there were rules and taboos around color, specifically black and white. But like most artists, she ignored them. I don't think a lot of traditional mentality people are understanding what I'm doing, so I'm okay with that. That's not who I'm trying to target. I think I'm trying to target a more newer generation that's willing to try something more unique and something that's more different. Growing up, it, it was sort of, I had a wardrobe, like my Western wardrobe or my Canadian wardrobe to wear to school, but then I had my Indian wardrobe to wear to like any sort of Indian function. So right now, basically what I'm trying to do is bring those two wardrobes together. And I think that's why my pieces have been doing so well because it's speaking to like a broader audience, a more diverse audience that feels the same way that I did growing up, that it always felt separated, but now I'm sort of saying like, why does it need to be that way? Why can't it be just one wardrobe? So I still use the same silhouettes, but I don't use the same colors. Indian clothing is very colorful. You'll see pieces that are like pink, orange, red, green, blue, all in one 
dress. And that's so not me. I'm, I'm more like subtle and monochromatic. I use a lot of creams, whites, blacks, and then I'll throw in like accents of blue. Culturally, uh, the color white is something that like Indians would wear to a funeral. Um, so it's not something that you want to incorporate into bridal wear because it's not good luck. Um, black, again, is like, again, a darker color and it's like associated with evil and not good things. So it's not something that they want to use. But to me personally, I feel that it's subjective and it's however you want to portray it. So this is like one of my favorite fabrics right here, like the lace and the beading. And I love the fact that it's black. People love the whole lace idea, but they don't like the lace idea with black. But that's something that I would continue to use because I, I want to push the box and push the boundaries. When I was in fourth year and I was doing my thesis collection, um, I incorporated black into my bridal wear. And we had to present the project to a group of judges. And one of the judges happened to be South Asian and he kind of knew the traditional colors that were and weren't supposed to be used. So he actually called me out on it in front of all the judges and told me, you use black in your collection, you're not supposed to, you know nobody is gonna buy it. But I mean, two years down the road, you see in like Vogue India that black is the new bridal color. So it just goes to show that like I need to keep following my gut feeling about something and keep doing what I want to do rather than listening to others. The inspiration of the clothing is South Asian, but the clientele that's really interested in it or wants to purchase it is very diverse. I don't want to limit myself to just being a designer for South Asians just because I'm Indian. I want my clothes to be for everyone. It's about kind of creating this seamless blend between two cultures, like growing up Canadian but being born in India. When I'm going out, I'll, I'll take one of my Indian pieces and wear it, or I'll wear like Indian accessories with a more modern outfit. It's just, it's just one closet now. I don't feel like there's two separate things. Stay with us now. We'll be back after a short break. I'm Duncan McHugh. Tomorrow on The Current, Steve Cody runs a software company with a robust future, but his mission in life is to prevent the tragedy of his son's deadly overdose from happening to anyone else. That's on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1.
Wind Calls the Heart. New season this summer on CBC. We're collecting and sharing the stories of Canadians That's hard. from coast to coast to coast. Oh, wow. Tell us yours <laughs> at cbc.ca slash what's your story. You can see it in the faces of Manchester's residents and on the signs they've been carrying defiance, solidarity and strength in the wake of Monday's attack. Despite so many dead and so much fear remaining, it's a city determined to remain unbroken. The CBC's Margaret Evans is there. Manchester has lived through many incarnations, each one marking the city for better or worse. But somehow, managing to leave that particular Mancunian spirit in place. This past week, has challenged that spirit in new ways, anger and grief inhabiting the streets. And it's happened everywhere, but Manchester today has been hit hard the most. Uh, it won't be the same. But the people of Manchester are nothing if not resilient, and today a very different act of defiance was underway in the city's tattoo parlors, no less. All day today, the buzz of the needle struggled to keep up with demand for tats in the shape of a worker bee. For the lamppost, the bins, it's in mosaics on the floor. It's the symbol of our city, and it just, like, it represents how we unite and we work hard. Lauren Walker says it's her way of fighting back against the senselessness of what happened in Manchester earlier this week, and she's not alone. Tattoo artists like Pep Kernock are donating their time for free for anyone asking for a bee tattoo over the next few days. The money paid goes to a fund to help victims of the attack and their families. Well, Manchester people stick together. They're quite proud of where they come from. Manchester, of course, was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution and all the social ills that brought with it. But it also means that some of the greatest reform movements in the history of the country were born here. People here are very proud of that history. Harder to digest, perhaps, is that despite all the pride of place, the bomber was also from Manchester. Salman Abedi was born in a neighborhood called Moss Side, where other homegrown jihadists are thought to have been radicalized. Even so, most Mancunians won't let it shake their idea of who they are. He's from Manchester, but that doesn't mean that he represents Manchester as, as well, any more than he represents his religion. And so, the renaissance of the bee. Even the street artists are doing their bit to raise civic pride. It's a nice metaphor for the people of the city, really. And it's probably the coolest logo for a city in Britain, you know? Like, everyone else's logos are a bit rubbish compared to ours. <laughs> and it means something to people here. So cute. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Manchester. We want to leave you tonight with the story of one young man. Martin Hett. 29, was a PR manager already known online as a Coronation Street superfan. But he was also famous for this, a tweet of his mother's lonely table at a craft fair. She hadn't sold anything, and his heart was, quote, breaking. It's hard to say no to a loving son in despair. First, a friend snapped up Flora the Glove Monster, and soon the knitted dolls were selling like hotcakes. His mom gained an online fan base of her own, and Het became known far and wide as the kind of son any mother would have been lucky to have. Martin Het was one of those who died in the Manchester bombing. That's The National this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.